Harry's Wife, Part 95.18 The Humiliation of Prince Harry, Part 1 Hello, I'm H.G. Tudor, and I'm here to educate you about narcissism, to tell you about what makes a narcissist, how to spot a narcissist, to understand the various facets and aspects of the behaviour of a narcissist. Also, to enable you to recognise the dynamic between a narcissist and the victim of a narcissist. I do this primarily to help people understand what they might be dealing with themselves. And one of the most effective tools to achieve that is by utilising real-life examples. Famous people, infamous people, photographs and video footage. The feedback that I have had from people where they've stated it makes it so much easier to understand HG when you unpick it through the use of an example in real life. Secondly, I do this so people can actually understand what is driving Harry's wife's behaviour and also how it affects Prince Harry and why he behaves in the way that he does. There will be some of you listening to this video who have been ensnared by a narcissist, most likely in a romantic setting, possibly also in a familial one, those being the two most common. Many of you listening, however, will not have experienced this dynamic. And this is where there's often misunderstanding, as people impose their own worldview on the behaviours, understandably so, but mistakenly so, and they call it something else. They think the dynamic is just, that's the way this couple rolls, that it's fire and ice, that it's tempestuous, that it's the making up and breaking up and so on and so forth. Many people listening haven't experienced the narcissistic dynamic and it's important for them to understand it so that they can make sense of the behaviours of Harry's wife and in turn how that impacts upon Prince Harry. I've explained previously what the dynamic is between the two of them in the same way I've explained the dynamic that exists between Will Smith and Jada Pinkett Smith. Simply put, Harry is the intimate partner primary source of his wife. He's the most important provider in terms of control, fuel, character traits and residual benefits, which are the prime aims. He was ensnared, he was seduced and given a golden period, and he thought that he'd met the most wonderful woman in the world. Then he finds himself being devalued, which is where he is now. A period of sustained devaluation, where he's subjected to various malign manipulations and treated to respite golden periods, restoration of the good stuff, that keeps him in situ. We have not reached the point of escape, nor have we reached the point of disengagement. Harry is in the sustained devaluation. One of the things that a narcissist can do to the victim is to essentially strip you of the notion of who you are. We attach you to us. We do not attach to you. That's why we, at the point of disengagement, can walk away so easily without nary a glance over our shoulder, leaving you a dried-out husk lying in the dirt, having been drained of your fuel, drained of your money drained of your self-esteem and self-worth, severed from your friends, broken from your family, demeaned, physically weakened, exhausted, sapped. In short, we take away the very essence of what you are, and, in so doing, graft you onto us, so that you become infective with what we are. That doesn't mean that you become a narcissist, but rather it means that you lose a semblance of who you are. This doesn't happen to everybody, but it is common that the victim becomes stripped of their own identity, and we then impose our own identity on you. You speak as we speak. You do as we do. You think that the things that we say and suggest you ought to go along with, and even where you might have some semblance of doubt about that, 
it's far easier just to go along with it, to avoid the rages, the silences, the scornful looks, the little digs, anything for a quiet life. This is what has been happening with Harry as he finds himself in a point of humiliation. Eroded, worn away, the Harry that existed prior to the spider coming along. He is but a shadow of himself, and the terrible thing is, of course, for him, he doesn't even realise this. Prior to the arrival of Harry's wife, Harry was known as the party prince, the playboy prince. He has an empathic, caring side, but alongside that he is known for a volcanic temper. That is his narcissist trait of anger, and where there is a diminution of his empathic traits, that comes to the fore. He also has a strong narcissistic trait of selfishness, and again, where the shrouding, guiding empathic traits are reduced, that manifests and shows as his sense of entitlement. Harry is no angel. He's a flawed individual, empathic, yes. But as I've ever was explained, empaths are not saints. He also has the layering of the impact of his mother's death when he was 12. And that has impacted upon his mental health and sits alongside the nature of who he is in a manner which causes him certain difficulties. Namely, that vulnerability that exists can and is exploited by others, chiefly, of course, his tormentor-in-chief, his wife, although, of course, he believes that she is the one that saves him and cannot see that she is the one that is slowly poisoning him. But prior to her arrival, he was seen as feisty, fun, outgoing. The army, of course, helped keep part of the narcissistic traits in check. It gave him discipline. It provided him with order. But we didn't see the level of behaviours that have now been witnessed. He was seen as the likeable spare, the younger brother to William, somewhat freed from most of the formalities that William has to deal with as heir to the throne, able to enjoy himself more, hence seen slamming down the Jaeger bombs, chasing some skirt, and people generally liked him for it. And then, as I've said before, along came the spider. His behaviour changed in two main ways with her arrival. Of course, when she first came, she did not reveal the devaluing behaviours we seldom do, the reason being... If we were to be read of tooth and claw at the beginning, we would lose control of you before we even got it, and that is contrary to the prime aims. This is why the narcissist presents you with an illusion of a person who's fun, who's interested in you, who's caring, who may appear to be compassionate, who mirrors your interests, mirrors your dislikes, takes you places, buys you things, flatters you, compliments, possibly gives you fantastic sex wants to spend lots of time with you, opens you up to new experiences. Your soulmate, the person that has arrived and all of a sudden blesses you with a new view on life. You can't believe your luck. It almost seems too good to be true. For Harry, when she came along and his addiction to people such as her surged into overdrive, two things happened. First of all, his love devity trait was manipulated by her presence and his own emotional thinking so that he fell madly, deeply, truly in love with her. That, of course, along with her own need to get him under control as quickly as possible, saw him moving at a very fast pace. And, of course, it bordered on obsession with her. Prince William saw it and counselled against the speed at which the relationship was moving. But the point is that his behaviour changed. He wasn't as feisty in terms of the relationship with her. He became pro focused on her. He wasn't the lad about town in the same way that he once was. People thought, well, he's happy. Good for him. And what a fantastic match to bring in a biracial... American divorcee into the royal family, 
to add some variety and some diversity. But the first change that was affected upon Harry, Harry was him becoming obsessed with her, which is common for the victims of the narcissist because it seems that they found such a wonderful person. The other thing that then happened was that in order to try and please her because he was so delighted that he had met her because he didn't want to lose her, he started to behave in a way where certain of his narcissistic traits did come to the fore. Argumentativeness, selfishness and anger. Repeatedly it was reported about the explosion of his tempers, of his temper in terms of what he wanted from her. When they came together, it was reported that there was a tsunami of temper tantrums, shouting matches, and of course the tiff over the tiara. Tina Brown, and more of her in a separate piece, who has the Palace Papers coming out, and there's serialization and comment on about this in various publications, explains that Palace sources report that the preparation for the Sussex Union was all drama all the time, as reported by Tina Brown in her new book. She explained that Harry's wife's modus operandi was seen as revving up Harry whenever she ceased, or whenever she sensed, any obstruction. She, as the narcissist, wants her own way. She doesn't care for tradition, convention, protocol. That gets in the way and is a threat to control. She, of course, can assert control directly, but in other instances she would do so indirectly, complaining about the way that she's being treated, which has two potential effects. The first, of course, is to get agreement from Prince Harry that the way that she's been treated, the way that she's been spoken to, was unacceptable. That gives her an unconscious sense of control, but it also allows her to effect control over somebody directly by proxy through Harry. And if you recall, there was the now infamous spat with the Queen's trusted dresser and confidant, Angela Kelly, over which tiara Harry's wife would get to wear, prompting Harry to bellow, whatever Meghan wants, Meghan gets. And then, of course, there was the dust-up with her future sister-in-law, Kate Middleton, reportedly over tights for flower girls that ended with, depending on who's telling the story, either Middleton or Harry's wife, or both, in tears. Tina Brown writes that a palace source divulged there was a lot of raging, in-person shouting in front of other members of staff, basically in front of too many people, which is why it all started to come out. Here... Harry's emotional empathy for other people was eroded by the presence of Harry's wife, subtly putting him under pressure, guilt-tripping him into getting him to do things for her, and, of course, utterly besotted with her and see you next Tuesday struck. He wanted to do the right thing for her. He feared losing her. He wanted to ensure that he kept her and that the relationship continued. This meant that the behaviours that he adopted were not appropriate and pleasant towards other people. Anger came to the fore, selfishness came to the fore, argumentativeness came to the fore, and it started to change him. It started to have certain aspects of the narcissistic side of Harry to come out. He was still in the golden period. He had been seduced and embedded as the intimate partner primary source as they marched towards marriage. She was treating him generally well. Maybe the odd pity play, you'd do it for me if you really loved me, that kind of thing. Or I can't believe that people are treating me this way, surely you think that I deserve it. And of course he would do, because it really would be anything for you, my queen. He was besotted, thought that he was happy, found this lady who'd come along and turned his life upside down and was no doubt enjoying the fact that attention was on him for a change also. After all, empathic people like attention too, but in varying degrees, dependent upon the strength of their narcissistic traits. And again, showmanship plays a part in this regard, of which Harry has a strong dose. 
His behaviour therefore altered in terms of, on her arrival, he became solely focused on her, and also his emotional empathy for other people became reduced, so that he would show the, the shouting matches, the drama about getting what she wanted. Of course, they then married, and then we saw as that eventually they moved to Canada and now California, and Harry moved into the sustained devaluation stage. And this might also be described as the period of when he has become infected and completely controlled. He now presents as a somewhat cowed individual. Witness the recent footage from the Harry's Wife games, I beg your pardon, the Invictus games, where the grip of doom was evident holding him, and he was there head bowed. How many times have you seen him looking dishevelled, puffy of face, looking exhausted, not particularly well dressed? He does look a shadow of his former self. The me you can't see is actually coming to the fore. That ship has landed. He is completely under her control. He has been isolated from other perceived adverse influences, mainly his family, but also his friends, so that all he more or less drinks of is what she pours into him. He can't think straight. He can't see straight. But he doesn't realise this. He adopts her language. Take, for example, saying that he wanted to protect his grandmother, which is a deluded observation, but the kind of thing that she would say. That he talks about having the right people around his grandmother. Again, nonsense. The Queen's surrounded by people who have her best interests at heart. Why is it that she's been able to be who she is for such a long time? But again, that's the kind of nonsense that Harry's wife would come out with. He talked about the Queen telling him things which she can't tell anyone else. Deluded and grandiosity. Again, the type of thing that Harry's wife would come out with. We've seen the various pronouncements that he's made about mental health without even realising that his own is deteriorating. These ideas of helping others, the authenticity, etc., spouting the word salad that is regularly stuffed into his ears on a daily basis. He stays away from people, influenced by her. His paranoia has increased, influenced by her own. And throughout this period of time, he's been repeatedly humiliated. Puppeteered to stand outside the window juggling the balls. This is a prince of the realm that has served in Afghanistan, reduced to being a clown. He is led by the nose, pushed in the back, pulled by the hand, told where to go, what to say, who to see. Kept away from anybody that is perceived as a potential threat. He's been engaged in the repeated shilling the rather an edifying experience, not far removed from going around with a begging bowl. In your face attempts to obtain money, most memory of which the barefaced shilling that took place with the Disney CEO, which of course I have analysed in parts passing. This individual, who had a sense of self, Harry, lagered up, jabbering away, generally a fun gay, fun guy with some temper associated with that, as I've explained, but a caring and empathic side also to, to him, a man dealing with the weight of position and the death of his mother. But now look at him. Where is the Harry that enjoyed himself? Even the games that he was involved in the devising of have been hijacked and utilised by his wife. He has been stripped of his personality. It is as if she has grafted him onto her, sucked the very life out of him, and then put her hand right up his backside and has parroted him, puppeting him away, the suck puppet that he has become, as he now engages in talking like her. That she has changed him, eroded him, wore away the sense of who Harry is, and as I mentioned earlier, just how this does indeed happen, 
This is part of the narcissistic dynamic. But there are people who don't understand and realize this. They come out with nonsense such as, they're living their best life, one of the worst phrases invented. Living in California together. Look at him. Is that a man living his best life, who doesn't see his friends, who's kept away from his family, who he now repeated argues with, a brother he was once extremely close to? What changed? Did William change? No, Harry has. And what was the catalyst for that change? His wife. He is being humiliated. More and more people dislike him. More and more people think that he's a brat, that he's self-entitled, that quite simply, they think he's an asshole. But this is the effect of his wife. There are others that are deluded themselves and think that he is happy. You only have to look at him to see that he is not. But he doesn't know what else to do. He talked about how, and again these are the words that he regurgitated, delivered to him by her, about how he didn't realise that he was trapped as he walked perhaps from one gilded cage into one where he was being randomly abused. That he talked about his father and his brother remaining trapped, echoing the words, undoubtedly, that have come from his wife's mouth. Added to this, of course, he's not the sharpest tool in the toolbox. He's not the brightest bulb, and therefore it makes it all easier, combined with his addiction to her, to puppet him in this way, to strip him of the notion of who Prince Harry is, and to humiliate him. In part two, I examine a number of ways that he has actually changed. Join me for that. <laughs>